So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, which is Jocelyn Vega. She was our speaker last week and did such a fantastic job. Um, Jocelyn and I have actually worked together a couple times now, and she is always so insightful and just a wonderful presenter on this very um, challenging topic, which is a topic that is very important to the work that we do, but also sometimes a little um, challenging to get your head around. And Jocelyn does a fantastic job of really sharing resources and starting those conversations. So with that, Jocelyn, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And good morning, everyone. I am loving uh, always walking into an educational space. It's like the one field where you don't have to prompt people to say good morning or to get that going. So I just want to give you some appreciation for bringing your cheer, bringing yourselves into this. And I'm wondering, do we have anyone new um, who's joining us in the series? You can drop us uh, an emoji as people do now and stickers on your little icon box. You can say yes, no. I um, just want to know if anyone's brand new. So I can make sure I can like really, really support everyone here. So we're getting a mix, right? Some people know, some people yes. Um, and I'm very excited. I'm very excited for our new friends and our old friends. We're all friends here. And just to give you a little bit of a background. Oh, Bridget, you're raising your hand. Go for it. No? Okay. Well, you let me know, Bridget. We're right here. So this is a very important topic for me of culture and trauma. As Amy said, it can be difficult, right? It's like talking about culture. We're talking about trauma. I'm here. I live in this world, right? But I just want to encourage us that this is an empowering topic. The more we know, the more that we're willing to engage, the more that we are here for one another and especially ourselves, we can have massive uh, cultural impacts. All of you working with students, families, or the edu educational settings that you support, that's a culture. School is a culture. Everyone jumping on and saying good morning without being prompted reflects a workplace culture that is unique to where you work. If you don't believe me, um, remember when you started a new job. And when you started a new job, you're like, okay, I have to learn how people do this this way. I have to pick this up. This is completely different than what I did in my old job. And it's the same task. That reflects a culture that exists in a workplace. So I'm really excited for today's topic, um, culture and trauma. And again, this is an empowering time. Um, I just want to check in. Uh, Amy, am I, I see you're on mute. I just want to make sure I'm not missing something. Beautiful. And thank you for everyone too, who said, yes, no, I'm new, smiley face. Really appreciate knowing who's in this room. So what are some of our learning objectives? Some of our learning objectives are the following. We want to learn of the impact of traumatic events through a cultural lens. We wanna engage in what are cultural contexts of trauma. So this part, I will say everyone, we're not gonna, we're not gonna cover everything. We're, we're unfortunately not. And it's not to be discouraging, it's not to overwhelm anyone, right? It's just to say that this is a lifetime work and each of us have a lifetime of experiences. And that can be a lot to unpack, a lot to do in 90 minutes, but you're gonna be definitely equipped to continue this within your own lives, the students you're connected to, and whoever else crosses your path because trauma-informed care is life skills that I say over and over again because if you attended the last training, trauma impacts our very bones, our cells, uh, our breathing, right? It's in this body and the bodies of others. And throughout the training, because if you know me, we don't talk about trauma without uplifting healing and that resiliency. And we do that by bringing in a strength-based approach. Also trauma-informed care, but let's you know break that down. So these are the learning objectives. I wanna quickly pause and just you know give you a moment. What are your objectives? What do you wanna learn? So you can say, how do I support students? Um, how do I... How do I navigate to over two years of learning loss? How do I support a generation who was isolated for two years in their development, right? That young adulthood, teen years, you name it. So just giving you the opportunity to chat, to unmute, 
but what are your objectives? Because for me, there's no point. I'm just here to just share. I'm here to make you make you feel supported. So yes, yeah, awesome. Betsy's leading the way. Betsy says supporting students and understanding my own response. Beautiful, Betsy, you're definitely at a right place. Um, just because our response is pivotal. No matter no matter if we feel like we can't change a situation, no matter if we feel like I can't really do anything for this student or situation, your response is sometimes the most important step that you can take. Because we can't undo trauma, but what we can do is control our thoughts, our minds, and have that awareness, right? There's so much power that we got here. We have more friends who are sh sharing. Thank you, Kathy. Learn about the spectrum of trauma experiences, absolutely. And during today's time, we're gonna do that during a cultural lens. So we'll have a cultural lens perspective. We'll see the spectrum of trauma within culture, um, within the United States, but in the world. We have here Jenny, thank you so much. Looking for ideas I can use as a leader in supporting staff, students, and helping those staff support our students. Absolutely, Jenny, trauma-informed care is a two-way street. Right For me to be trauma-informed and trauma-responsive, what am I receiving? What practices do we have? And what can I learn from my team members? So shout out to you, Jenny, for thinking ahead. I love that intention. Karen, best support students, marginalized identities, how to support. We have here Darlene. This is tough. This is tough, right? Because I feel like a lot of us are in this situation, but we're stronger together. And it is, how do I support young grandchildren who lost two years of face-to-face -face learning? And that's key, people. We actually talk about that later, of the loss of the face-to-face -face and reintegrating, reintroducing face-to-face -face activities, programming can actually be traumatic and stressful for some students and families that we're supporting. This return to in-person can be traumatic for individuals as well. Um, and you might say, Jocelyn, this is better, you know, we're able to do this work, but it's about their perspective. And I've worked with young people this, this fall, this past fall, we're still in fall, my apologies, we're still in the fall. Um, and I had some young people who told me that they didn't think in person was real anymore. And when I inquired, like, what do you, what do you mean by that? You know, these are teens, these are 13 to 17 years old. Like, what do you mean in person's not real? You know, I would love to learn more. Thanks for sharing with me. And it was, I was in a Zoom for two years. I only saw my parents come in and out. And now I have to be somewhere and be on time and do all this. It's too much work. This doesn't, this doesn't feel like the life, the program that I want. And instead of being heartbroken and disappointed and unsure, I really saw that as an opportunity to build a relationship to understand how much strength, effort, and time the student has put in. So absolutely. And the, the chat keeps going, right? We have Mandy supporting students, unprecedented levels of trauma, absolutely, while supporting our own burnout. And thank you for that. How to support students and not letting trauma negatively affect me and my job. We can absolutely talk about that during today. I got some tips for us. And then the last chance, right, is understanding how culture impacts trauma and how that impacts the students. Because people, your culture from your generation, background, you name it, is different than everyone else's background, trauma, and experiences, right? And then we have a, gen a new generation of students that we're supporting, right? People joke Gen Z, people joke, you know, now Gen C, like the letter C. And then we also have adult learners who have their own generational upbringing and connection, and we're all under one roof. And then we have our own generations that we're a part of. So a lot of generations in the mix. So thank you so much, everyone, for chatting, for being here, for making this time. I do want to say, if there's something you want to share privately, and only I see, but you want to kind of put it out there for the group, message icoy icoy and i would send a message privately to me if you want that as an option so thank you everyone we kind of know who's in the room what we're interested in as you know we're going to take care of ourselves so this training is being recorded 
I want you to truly engage with yourself. We learned last week that learning about trauma can even be traumatic, right? Learning languages, information can cause some stress, just picking up this information, even though we're physically safe, we're in our homes, we're comfortable. Information and learning things can really do a number on us. So this is why we step out and take a break, engage with your senses. Maybe you have some water, maybe you have a pillow, maybe you're in a comfy seat. Be in this body, be in this space, and be in this time. There's no test. There's nothing you have to prove. Nowhere you have to go unless you really have to go somewhere, right? Um, just be yourself and take what you want. Literally take what you want. It will always be there for you, right? This training, the slides, everything. In this training as well, especially if you're, you know, somewhere where you can stand up and stretch and pour and move this body. And then I always ask, what is one way you're going to debrief after today? So how are you going to decompress? Are you going to talk to someone? Are you going to walk your dog? Are you going to eat lunch? And I'm, I'm going to really encourage people, especially if you're not a chatter, write it down in your journal, your post and note. What is one thing you're going to do? And we can't, we can't move forward. <laughs> can't move forward without it. We can't. Because if we're not doing something for ourselves to show up with others, it's going to be hard to show up for a while and consistently and long term. So we have here Lisa. We are doing some yoga. That is amazing. Personally, I'm just going to go outside. I feel like getting fresh air really makes a difference, especially with the heater on. It's so dry. It's, it's nothing like good old air. We have someone who is swimming. What an inspiration. I love it. We have reading for pleasure, raking leaves. We got our friends still raking leaves. So someone break out their rake and help out our friend. Um, you know, what is it, Kathy? Yeah, good luck with that. And then beautiful people stepping away, lunch, you name it. So as we reflect on what we're doing, I will remind you of how you're decompressing because we need to come back and we need to come down. You'll learn why uh, after today's training. So let's also pause, people. It's Wednesday. It's been a week. Uh, it's December somehow. And let's just take one minute, one minute to breathe it out. Gather ourselves before we take on new information. So it's going to be really quick. If you're hesitant, totally want to respect where you're at, but at least try it out. You can keep your eyes open. You can just relax, right? Um, and then this is just a small offering. So thank you for your time. So sitting comfortably, just taking a big, deep breath in through the nose, out through the mouth. As you breathe in, noticing how the body expands. As you breathe out, just watching the body soften as you gently close the eyes. And rather than the mind leading the breath, allow the breath to lead the mind. Notice the sensation of the breath. Notice it where you feel it in the body. If you need to, you can just gently place your hand on the stomach. And just following that rising and falling sensation. Nothing else to do. Allowing thoughts to come and go. And when you're ready, just gently opening the eyes again. Thank you so much, everyone, for that literal minute of your time. I had a silly moment where I was like, did my internet go out? This is, this is what's going on? And it was still going. And I just realized it was the own impatience of my, my mind, right? And this body just ready to go, which is incredible. But it says a lot, right? It says a lot when we are interrupted with a sense of urgency and busyness when it's just literally a minute. So that is me putting myself out there for any friends who felt rushed or felt like that was difficult. I hope that was helpful um, for any of you, right? I think this is a really great tip. If you're having a difficult conversation, right? Maybe you had a difficult conversation, you took on a lot of information, or maybe you need to transition in and out of your workday, right? 
Your body is an incredible tool. And we'll learn why in this training, culturally, we need to do more, more work around that. So thank you, everyone. And now I want to just prepare you uh, for this next section. It is about the impact of trauma. We literally had a training last week on this, but this is different, right? And I want to make sure that everyone has that time. Okay. So I think, I think we have a friend who is unmuted. Um, if someone could help me out. And thank you so much for that. And yes, let's dive into it, everyone. Thank you. And Betsy, appreciate your chat. Thank you for prompting me to just breathe. Beautiful. So I have a quick poll. Nothing's going to pop out. We're going to go old school and chat it out. Uh, and it is, do you, even, do you see a relationship between culture and trauma? There is not a right or wrong answer, just doing a temperature check, right? As if we were in person. So yes, no, maybe, and there's a typo, I apologize, not sure. And we have some friends who are saying, yes, we're saying A, we're across the board. And I just wanna tell everyone, if you're like on the no crowd, like I'm not, I'm not seeing it, welcome, welcome. We need to be open about these things and it's totally okay, right? We have maybe, and then again, I apologize for that, the not sure. We have here Kathy, thank you. Yes, yeah, some cultures discourage expression of emotion, others promote it. Absolutely. We're actually going to dive into that, Kathy. So, you know, I'm going to look out in the Zoom world and give you a head nod when we come around there. So, thank you, everyone, for just that quick poll. Again, you are welcomed, and I want you to feel embraced if there's some maybes, there's some no's, or Maybe you feel like that with some cultural aspects and not with others. That's okay. That is a lot to work with. And all of us have been in those shoes. So don't feel shy. And beautiful. I love this. Zoe, you are landing the plane. It says, I'm not sure. Some cultures, for example, immigrant groups go through some trauma, but I'm not sure if there's a direct correlation. Absolutely. I think we can talk about that. And if Anyone in the crowd wants to respond to Zoe, I think that can be a great place um, for you to show up for a peer of, you know, immigrant groups and the trauma they experience. Is that cultural? And that's broad, right? You just, we can throw it out. And Zoe, I'll come back to this wonderful perspective. So everyone who's new, uh, we did have a training last week that really dove into what is trauma. And today's training is going to not stay here too long. So just Apologies, but it's all going to come together. So very quickly, uh, what is trauma is defined by three E's, and it is event, experience, and effects. Um, today, in this training, we're really going to be looking at historical, intergenerational, and also the set of circumstances like policy, and how policy can have a huge impact on our social lives. Everyone here in education has probably seen or when is the impact of policy, funding, resources on the outcomes for students? I'm sure maybe to one extent or at one point, right? And that is something of policy, programming, and funding. Doesn't sound directly traumatic, but when we think about the quality of life and experiences and opportunities, it can have a lifetime difference for many of us and those who we're connected to. So with Zoe, your, your question of, you know, not sure if immigrant groups, you know, have a direct correlation to told culture and trauma, I think there is a lot. I think there can be a whole training on this, if I'm being honest, just like many marginalized identities. For example, we want to think about socioeconomics. We want to think about even discrimination, right? Of uh, Maybe a student who is from an immigrant background whether their parents or them themselves, never feels like they truly belong or feels like there are some things without their permission, without their participation, they're, they're singled out on. So one thing I've seen and have experienced myself is being singled out just for an accent. And just literally speaking, someone's able to identify, you didn't grow up here, you're not from here right? Where are you really from? Um, you know, are, are you, you going to say, oh, I'm from Chicago, you know, that's where I'm born. No, 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 like, 
that's not that's not it and it's like okay great and experiencing those things I guess I'm getting personal now experiencing those things myself as young as five years old right so that is just one example of you know there are some cultural practices of that where are you really from do you really belong here right? You don't fit in this image of what it means to be a Chicagoan, what it means to look like from the United States, so on and so forth, right? We also have this with gender. Gender can be a set of circumstances, right? Of growing up being told, you need to dress like this, you need to be like this, you need to act like this. Um, I remember, you know, there's this huge shift that I see young kids go through when they're hitting those puberty years, right? Of we're going to be you know, caring in there for you. We're going to let you cry it out versus, all right, you need to get over this because now you're becoming a big kid. You're becoming an adult. You need to stop acting like this. You're no longer a baby. Yet last week we talked about trauma, emotions, behavior, relationships onward, right? And yet we see in our society how boys and girls, for the most part, are treated very differently when it comes to basic things of our humanity, like emotions and expressing them. And that's a set of circumstances. So, Zoe, I hope that helps. You know, let me know. Uh, I want to make sure I'm landing the plane. And yes, Betsy, there are shared norms and assumptions for immigrants. This is a subculture within a culture. Absolutely. So, Betsy, I can tell we're going to get along. And everyone, we're all getting along. But shout out to you. So, people, I'm going to throw you off a little bit. I'm going to just warn you now. Stress is a part of our culture, and you're going to hear that throughout this section. And I, I, again, being very careful, right, because I don't want to throw people off too far, but this section is actually about us and the culture we are constantly navigating as adults, professionals, and other areas of our life. Stress has been normalized within our society, but we can think about even things like finances and recent inflation. And how stressful that can be of a decision and options I have, I now have to second guess or think. And maybe we're not in those shoes, but I can name a lot of people who have been, right? And this is traumatic to our body, mind, and emotional well-being. There's also different types of stress that can cause internal, mental, and emotional trauma in our bodies. And that can be toxic stress, stress arousal, chronic stress and then even traumatic stress. I also wanna say students are experiencing this too. We all know it's finals time, right? It's not super fun for many of many students. And we probably see all of these things at once. I wanna encourage you that if any forms of these stress is interest you, I'm gonna be sending some follow-up resources. So if you're like, Jocelyn, I really, I really struggle with this type of stress and how to support students. Drop it in the chat and I'll follow up with some resources. So thank you. And we have here um, a few chats, right? Culture impact the way you perceive events. Mandy is saying stress is upheld in a lot of our society. And you thinking, and then we have Karen who's like, let's think about our culture and our identity, really distinguishing those two because yes, we should, Karen. And then Anthony, what is an example of stress arousal? Absolutely. So we've all had a time when we've experienced a type of stress. Let's say Jimmy, our child or someone who we're taking care of, you know, isn't waking up for school, is really having a hard morning, as we like to say, right? You're now late. You have a meeting that you're supposed to be at, and now you're rushing to it. You run a red light and you have a speed ticket that just gave you a $70 ticket, you know, and things just keep happening and building up and things get really intense some hours have passed, right? Maybe it's the afternoon now and you receive a stressful email and you are so upset and everyone's been there. I know we've all been here. We raised our hands up receiving an email that made you angry physically, emotionally. And you're like, did I really just get this from this person? Right? And then you start typing or you take a break. No, I don't know who you are and how you do these things. But that example of, one stress leading the other. And then something happens in a totally different context, different person, different place and time, yet you are still aroused physically, mentally, emotionally within that earlier stress. 
that you actually haven't come down from that stress. You haven't come back to your baseline before that stress, that if anything else comes across your path, you are aroused and further stress. And it's a further and further and further escalation. And we're going to watch a video because this isn't just me giving you a, a funny story. This is literally taking place in our body on a cellular level. So I hope that helps, Anthony. And we do have a video coming up next. But we do have to talk about stress within our culture because it's impacting all of us like trauma. So people, this video is going to... It's going to go real deep and talk about in your body, how you're responding to trauma, stress, and you're not fully aware of it. I'm not, right? It's not like you get a fax that says, hey, you know, Jocelyn, you're experiencing this, 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 this today. And these alarms went off and this went off in your gut. We might see some of those things. But we have to understand how much our body is experiencing and going through. So with that, I'm going to play this video. It's very technical. And I hope, you know, I hope you get some beautiful pieces out of it. Cramming for a test? Trying to get more done than you have time to do? Stress is a feeling we all experience when we are challenged or overwhelmed. But more than just an emotion, stress is a hardwired physical response that travels throughout your entire body. In the short term, stress can be advantageous, but when activated too often or too long, your primitive fight or flight stress response not only changes your brain, but also damages many of the other organs and cells throughout your body. Your adrenal gland releases the stress hormones cortisol, epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, and norepinephrine. As these hormones travel through your bloodstream, they easily reach your blood vessels and heart. Adrenaline causes your heart to beat faster and raises your blood pressure, over time causing hypertension. Cortisol can also cause the endothelium, or inner lining of blood vessels, to not function normally. Scientists now know that this is an early step in triggering the process of atherosclerosis, or cholesterol plaque buildup in your arteries. Together, these changes increase your chances of a heart attack or stroke. When your brain senses stress, it activates your autonomic nervous system. Through this network of nerve connections, your big brain communicates stress to your enteric or intestinal nervous system. Besides causing butterflies in your stomach, this brain-gut connection can disturb the natural rhythmic contractions that move food through your gut, leading to irritable bowel syndrome, and can increase your gut sensitivity to acid, making you more likely to feel heartburn. Via the gut's nervous system, stress can also change the composition and function of your gut bacteria, which may affect your digestive and overall health. Speaking of digestion, does chronic stress affect your waistline? Well, yes. Cortisol can increase your appetite. It tells your body to replenish your energy stores with energy-dense foods and carbs, causing you to crave comfort foods. High levels of cortisol can also cause you to put on those extra calories as visceral or deep belly fat. This type of fat doesn't just make it harder to button your pants. It is an organ that actively releases hormones and immune system chemicals called cytokines that can increase your risk of developing chronic diseases such as heart disease and insulin resistance. Meanwhile, stress hormones affect immune cells in a variety of ways. Initially, they help prepare to fight invaders and heal after injury, but chronic stress can dampen the function of some immune cells, make you more susceptible to infections, and slow the rate you heal. Want to live a long life? You may have to curb your chronic stress. That's because it has even been associated with shortened telomeres, the shoelace tip ends of chromosomes that measure a cell's age. Telomeres cap chromosomes to allow DNA to get copied every time a cell divides without damaging the cell's genetic code. 
and they shorten with each cell division. When telomeres become too short, a cell can no longer divide, and it dies. As if all that weren't enough, chronic stress has even more ways it can sabotage your health, including acne, hair loss, sexual dysfunction, headaches, muscle tension, difficulty concentrating, fatigue, and irritability. So, what does all this mean for you? Your life will always be filled with stressful situations, but what matters to your brain and entire body is how you respond to that stress. If you can view those situations as challenges you can control and master, rather than as threats that are insurmountable, you will perform better in the short run and stay healthy in the long run. Thank you everyone for watching that video. And before we, you know, open up the floor, I wanna give you the floor if there's any questions, anyone wants to unmute. I think it's very important that we exercise non-judgment that we are compassionate and empathetic with ourselves. Um, this video can be triggering. It can even just be traumatic to know all the levels that our body is handling this stress, uh, being alive sometimes, trauma. And that is what I'm going to ask you is to be non-judgmental and compassionate. And like our friend in the video said at the end, recognize, recognize that you're doing your best right? Even just acknowledging your response of raise my hand and put myself out there. You know, I sometimes engage in eating habits or, you know, not completing certain actions that would be healthy for me because I'm exhausted, I'm tired, and I, and I don't have the effort to do things. And instead of beating myself up when I'm already down, you exercise that compassion and empathy and tell yourselves, validate yourselves how hard you're trying and that you can try again. Just putting it out there for anyone who might be on this boat with me and who's ever experienced that, especially when it comes to the body. So with that, just want to see if there's questions, uh, anything so far. If you just need a moment to pause, I did put a comic for you. Um, we do feel like this sometimes, right? Especially when we got all these stresses going on. Um, this is another example, Anthony, of stress arousal. So stress is holding me together. You, you try to relax, you try to let things go, and then you feel worse. You feel, you feel like you're hitting a wall by trying to relax. That is a strong example of stress arousal. So giving that time, checking in. It's also a good moment to have silence, right? So giving you that moment of silence too, if anyone just needs that as well. Beautiful. Well, we'll have more of these pockets of time. Uh, just giving you that. And here are some definitions of trauma and stress, just to give you that information. Uh, the video highlighted a lot of this, so I'm not going to cover it too much. But I would recommend, we had a question in the chat of, you know, how do I help students who disclose something traumatic and then they're gone? right? It's like a total, total cutoff. Um, it's kind of like you did something really scary and you, you don't want to go back to what that scare was. We've all been there. We've all experienced, right? It's not just the students. We run away. That trauma response of flight, right? I'm flying away. I'm not coming back. I'm going as far as I can. So I think that can help with your question. Just recognizing that might be a trauma response, especially if they disclose trauma, right? The student is flying away. One thing I've done um, across settings, it was a lot in legal spaces. So I didn't represent people, but I worked in legal spaces where we did represent people. And I would try to prepare clients without scaring them, the types of stress that might come up within this work, within their case, with going to court, with big deadlines, right? Again, not to discourage people, but, but to be predictable about what could come up and me telling them because I wanted to support them. I wanted them to not be put on the spot if these things came up. So it's all about timing too, right? It's all about timing too, especially building that relationship and that trust, which we'll talk about later. But I talked about and identified what are some stresses that come along this process. And I wonder, do we do this? You know, do you do this? Um, 
uh, each student's different, right? There's not a roadmap. There's not a clear one, two, three of what is going to stress people out. But even just being um, willing to have a slide up or a poster up or something of types of stress or the emotion wheel, we learned last week, that can be a really helpful tool of having an emotion wheel. And another thing I did with clients, again, this was in a legal space, but like your students you work with, they're also in situations of life and death sometimes, or it can feel like a major life event where they're stuck, they're not sure, they're coming to you. Um, I would, in the beginning, when you're meeting someone, asking them, hey, how do you like to be supported? How do you like communication? How, and you, you say it your own way, right? You say it your own way, but you know what I mean? How do you like to receive feedback, right? And then maybe you warm that person up once you get to know their preferences, you know, hey, there are some things that might come up and I'm not talking directly to you. I'm talking about overall what might happen and I want to support you, right? So we have finals coming up. We have class registration coming up. We have tuition payments due, you name it, right? And then asking the student, right, you want to participate with them, what are stresses they anticipate? And then you can really model your service of these are things that we can take on together. You know what your preferences are. You know a little bit about my style. And then before a crisis happens, right, you want to consistently give people the feedback of, hey, you, I saw this issue. You brought this to me. You resolved it. And I just want to highlight how you took that on and the leadership I saw because you did that. And thank you for letting me be a part of that. And that's how you build up resiliency to stress, to other experiences by building up that person's strength while, while there's no um, major test of life or circumstances. So that when there is a crisis, there is a situation, you have that relationship and you have that information to be supportive versus, okay, what do I do now? Which is okay. That's always okay but you can build these things up earlier on. And I've done that. And it's been very helpful with the clients that I serve who are unfortunately in sometimes life and death situations, right? And, you know, take it and spin it your own way. So great question, really love that. And I wanna highlight too that there are shared roots to trauma and stress. And as we saw in some definitions, there's even like traumatic stress. And stress causes trauma in the body. So some larger things to keep in mind, and we're going to transition to culture soon. We have our social environments, access to resources. We've all probably lived through one example in our life of having access to a resource, like a higher paycheck, housing, your own housing, you name it, probably help the quality of life, probably supported you in another way, helped you with flexibility. Access to resources might not sound traumatic, but absolutely can be. We have individuals who are maybe targets for hate and harm or discrimination. And sometimes as an individual, you're just like, is it me? What's wrong with me? And you can internalize that hatred within yourself. And we see this with young children. We can even experience this as adults. Uh, we've probably experienced this entering workplaces. And I'm just thinking about workplaces where you were diminished, where you weren't supported, right? Like this even takes place in our work environments. So we have here Betsy who say, I tell my students when they are disclosing that they might want to stay away. Um, and if they would, would, if they should come back when they are ready, that I am always happy to see them. Absolutely. I didn't even mention what to do at the actual meeting if that happens. So I think that's really great, Betsy. Um, I think something else that can be a great way to close that conversation is list or highlight previous experiences that student has had or overcome. And I think validating them and what they've accomplished. Because the last thing you want to feel after putting yourself out there in this very emotional state is, Okay, bye. Thanks. I'm leaving now. I'm, I'm going to fly away, right? That trauma response. 
So I think, again, highlighting the strengths, highlighting the accomplishment, and we need you to be that coach. We're going to highlight that in a moment. We need that coach. When you see if you played sports or have been in sports, right, when you're losing the game and you're running out of time, do you want the coach who's going to yell at you or kind of just leave you out there to hang and you should dry? No, you want that coach who's going to get on their knee, look at you, hype the team up, bring up the strengths, not let go what has been done, even if we're losing, because we're here and I see you and I've been here with you and we're not going to let this go, right? Like you need that type of coach to win that game. And you are that coach, people. Just want to give you a huge shout out. You're doing that job. You're doing this work. And people have you on their sideline. You're probably one of the few. So give yourself that appreciation that culturally you are supporting individuals in this educational space. So thank you for everyone for engaging. And let's highlight what is culture, right? We've been talking about this broadly. And here's one definition. It is a shared values, traditions, arts, institutions. It can be groups of people or like someone in the chat mentioned subgroups, sub subgroups, so subcultures. We even have countercultures, right? Um, so that can be a whole training in itself. And then we also want to distinguish, I forgot exactly who mentioned it, but distinguishing culture and identity. So all of us can exist in a culture, whether it's the school setting, right, your office, higher education, that's a culture. But every single one of us, if we were in a room together and I gave you sticky notes to write identities and umbrellas of identities, we would have information about people that we can't see, that we can't guess. And yet, we would be maybe surprised, amazed by all the diversity within the room from these lived experiences. So in today's training, it's very important for us to, yes, talk about culture, but um, as you saw in the last training, question, what is normal? And is there a myth to normal? Uh, and what's what gets normalized? Like, tr like certain stress, right? Why is certain stress normalized and not others? So we're going to watch a video on that. We also have to look at culture as what are some abandoned human needs? So I think about this all the time with parenting, right? And how parenting, you know, a lot of us are supported. A lot of us, you know, have those systems, but a lot of us don't. And our needs can get lost as we prioritize the needs of our children or those who we take care of right? We, we can prioritize someone else and we sacrifice ourselves sometimes, right? And that's a normalization of we're not going to fully provide those resources, right? Things like poverty, right, can really cause an abandonment of human needs and that human dignity. Societal barriers and exclusion is something else cultural. Um, you look at barriers and exclusion anywhere in the world, nations, city, rural, you name it, it's going to look different. And it's very important for us to pick up what is taking place in this college, what is taking place within our services of what are barriers, what are some things of exclusion, and not to be afraid or to think your work is meaningless or, you know, beat yourself up because there's all these problems. But because if we don't identify these barriers and exclusions, guess who's experiencing them? the students and families and communities that you're serving. It's not going to take too long for them to realize that. So that's part of our work of realizing, identifying it. We can't solve everything, of course, but we can put some speed bumps uh, you know, along those barriers and exclusion so that we can slow down and we can think about how we prepare people. And I want to just give so much respect and appreciation to all of you here. Because truly, especially in the space of education, higher ed, the point in life of the young people and students who you're connected to, I already, I'm giving y'all a high five at this point because I'm at five, I'm at five points. Um, you are society's first responders. You're supporting the professional and personal and educational development of the next generation. And that's not like Gen Z or Gen C generation of learners, generation of workers, generations of humans 
who are returning to learn and learn through themselves to achieve this educational milestone. Like that is significant people. And we think about all the times people got off the road of education, were kicked off it, had to start over. And who's there? You. You. You are that coach on the sideline. So that is a little bit about what is culture, some things to keep in mind in your very crucial role. So here is a visual just for you to take after today. Culture is not only you know, the definitions and examples we talked about, but it's also the visible and invisible parts of our society, the visible and invisible parts of you, those who you serve, and the things you'll never find out about that person. When I do trauma work, I don't do it when, oh, now this person's disclosing trauma. Let me, let me get into that mode. I approach trauma as an everyday lifestyle. And I know that can sound cliche, but as a teacher, I'm sure you, a teacher or educational setting or counselor or any role you have in this setting, you have a lifestyle approach of how you communicate, how you say good morning, et cetera, et cetera. And that's different if we would go to a medical field. That would be different if we went to a bank, right? It's different because of our visible and invisible culture that we all reinforce, right? So just a little, a little slide to visualize this. We have a quick poll to check in with everyone. And it is, what do you witness as cultural trauma within your role? Is it physical? Is it emotional? Is it behavioral? What are you, what are you picking up? And I should honestly put an all of the above option yeah, we got that G. Anthony, we're on the same path. Um, all of them, all of them, right? So I want to say that culturally, we perceive and receive information and experiences, but we also project them. We think about our behavior. We have to think as providers, what is the function behind this behavior? How do I take a step back? How do I breathe? How do I recognize maybe something's playing out in my office from a stress arousal? And I'm just this person here breathing, taking it all in, because maybe I'm one of the few people in this student's life where I actually feel safe to be vulnerable, to say what's on my mind, to be upset, because everywhere else around me, I have to shut up and keep that to myself and suppress it, because I can't do that at home. I don't have trustworthy friends to do that with. I'm not going to put myself out there. And it might all just collapse in front of you. And you might say, Jocelyn, that's a lot. And <laughs> that's unfair. I just want to tell you that it's not. It's heavy, right? You didn't do anything wrong. You're not responsible for that trauma. But remember, we are first responders in society. And just want to acknowledge that in everything we do and validate you if you've ever been in that situation that there's probably other stressors going on. And it's all just fumbling in that interaction. So I think it's very important for us. I'm just going to this a video of how culture, our society and trauma is hugely impacting us. And I've already talked about this, but I think it's important you hear from an expert. And I'm going to play that video now. And if you're familiar with the scholar, I'm really happy um, because they do great work and a lot of their work is very accessible. So I'm gonna play that now. Our guest, Dr. Gabor Mate. He's just written a new book with his son, Daniel, titled The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. Democracy Now!'s Nermeen Sheikh and I recently spoke to Gabor Mate. I began by asking him about the pandemic and the book's title, The Myth of Normal. So the pandemic actually revealed to us how toxic our idea of normal has been, because it showed us the desperate need for human connection that we all have. But this is in a culture that has been isolating and atomizing individuals for a long time, where loneliness has been an epidemic for decades. It showed the noxious effect of racism and inequality, because the people who had the um, greatest risk for being affected by COVID were those of uh, lower social class and of people of color. 
it uh, the normal that we came from in my perspective was already a toxic normal we don't want to go back to it because my contention in this book is what we consider to be normal in this society is actually neither natural or healthy and in fact it's a cause of much human pathology mental and physical and actually people's pathologies what we call abnormalities whether it's mental or physical illness are actually normal responses to what is an abnormal culture. And Dr. Gabor Mate, you say uh, in the book, in fact, that there are no clear lines between normal and abnormal. Could you explain what you mean by that and how you understand the spectrum along which these things lie? Well, the key here is trauma. Uh, trauma is a psychological wound that people sustain. And I'm saying that in this society, most of us, because of the nature of the culture, the way we raise children, the way we have to relate to each other, the very values of a society are traumatizing for a lot of people, so that it's false to say that some people are normal and others are abnormal. In fact, we're all on a spectrum of, of woundedness, which has great impact on how we relate to each other and on our health. And Dr. Mate, explain wh how you understand, as you say in the book, that uh, the term trauma has uh, uh, Greek origins, but that yeah. it's come to mean something quite different. I mean, in the Greek origin, it referred to a physical injury or a physical wound. Uh, but in uh, psychiatry, in the work of Freud and psychoanalysis, uh, in medical literature generally now, trauma is understood as a, a wound to the mind. It's a wound to the psyche, to our emotional being, and to the soul. And trauma is not what happens to us. People, when they think of trauma, they think usually of catastrophic events like a tsunami or a war or parents dying or sexual or a physical emotional abuse of a child. These events are traumatic, but they're not the trauma. The trauma is the psychic wound that we sustain. And our psychological traumas have lifelong impacts. And in my medical work, I found that psychological trauma, woundedness, underlies much of what we call disease, whether autoimmune illness or cancer or the various mental health conditions. And in our society, psychological woundedness is very prevalent, and it's a rather of an illusion to believe some people are traumatized and others are not. I think there's a spectrum of trauma that crosses all layers and all segments of society. Naturally, it falls heavier on certain segment, sections, uh, on, on people of color, people with um, uh, genders that are not fully accepted by society, uh, people of economic inequality uh, who suffer more from inequality, but the traumatization is pretty general in our culture. Gabor, I was wondering if you could take I some time. Have to pause. I'm very sorry. This we would be here the full 30 minutes we have left, um, but I hope that video was validating and not to scare anyone at all. Right? I think for me, when I watched that video, it it takes the conversation of trauma to the level that it needs to be because it's the level that's happening. That trauma is not what's individually wrong with someone or what's broken with us or what happened to us, but what are the very roots of trauma? Why is it continuing? Why is it amplifying? And as a society, are we willing to hold the line and normalize healing instead of the continuation of trauma? And I wanna say as educators, as individuals who are in this work, I feel like I'm your hype woman today, but it is so true that all of you, all of you are engaging in some type of supportive services to a world of trauma of a student, students, generations that we're unfamiliar with or will never truly find out. So just giving people a moment, if you want to drop something in the chat, if you have questions about the video overall, this is a great time. And, you know, here we got, we got Betsy and Jennifer, you know, applauding them that all educators truly need to take care with their learners. Learning is and is by nature an act that requires one to be vulnerable and cannot occur at the deepest level unless the environment and leader is inclusive, authentic, and safe. Thank you. And with that in mind, 
I also want to encourage all of us that we're not here just to talk about trauma. We're here, we're here to really grow healing and resiliency and safety. And everything we learned about the body today and last week can feel really daunting, like we're doomed. I, I felt like I was doomed when I first started this trauma work. Like I was not as optimistic as I am today. It really felt like I was going through a crisis by all this information. If you feel like that, I've been right there with you, my friend. And that's why I have this visual that healing also changes the brain. Forgiveness, compassion, empathy can literally change the wiring, the pathways, depending on where your attention goes, right? So I want to validate you within your healing journey already. I know this is about students and our roles and being a staff member, but as our friend Betsy, and maybe some of you are feeling, it's about us as people, right? So with that, I'm not seeing any questions come in. And thank you. Yes, medicine should take this more into account. Absolutely. If you watch the full lecture, and honestly, the field is growing to take trauma into our medical treatments and approaches, and it's beautiful and hopeful. So when we're doing this work, I think it's very important that we're proactive and intentional. And we identify what are trauma situations that I struggle with, that I don't feel prepared for, that left me confused. And this cannot, it doesn't feel the best, right? It just doesn't. But this is part of the vulnerable work and where the healing really takes place when we embrace those parts. And it is when we've ever, and you can change this chart, you can make your own chart. But as I mentioned, being trauma-informed is a lifestyle and you can start off by this idea of trauma glasses. So how am I putting on my trauma glasses, my cultural glasses, you name it, and identify what are situations, behaviors, emotions, you name it, that really throw me off, right? And it can be manipulation, it can be lazy, it can be resistance, you name it. And then take that pause, right? That's why we want to be proactive with this work. What are some things that I should consider or that I can do so that I can be as much as possible trauma-informed? And if you're like, Jocelyn, that's great. But what else is there besides just being aware of trauma? I hear you. It is to avoid re-traumatizing that individual, right? So the issue, the challenge, the mistake, the missed deadline, the meeting that never happened, all of that is real, it happened, it's there, right? We can't change that, just like we can't change the trauma that's taking place, whether we know about it or not, of that student's life. But what we do have the power to do is our mind and our behavior as a professional in that moment. And that is our power that we have and have access to, to avoid re-traumatization. So this activity, it, it, it could be helpful. I hope you pick it up. And yes, I got some examples coming right up. So this can be yes for students that we serve, but even your peers, even yourself, right? I don't know if anyone ever has been in a funk, takes a week or two, and you're like, wait, actually, this is what's bothering me. Actually, this is becoming a heavier part of my life. And I haven't, I haven't given myself some me time or even some compassion. I've just been beating myself up. So what could show up at work? Let's look at, let's look at this bad interview skills because we've all done an interview, right? But let's say you're trying to help a student with their professional development. They're not making eye contact. You know, do they want to be there? Do you even care? The list goes on, right? Trauma glass is off. But when we put them on, we can think about what's really going on. And if you have one instruction, if you're like, give me one thing, Johnson, how to be trauma-informed is asking yourself what's going on. Not what's wrong, not what, let me judge of this person, but what's going on? What's the larger context that maybe I'm missing and that I need to be open to? And it can be this cultural perspective of eye contact can be intimidating. Maybe I experienced trauma like emotional verbal abuse where 
I looked away because I wasn't able to have direct contact or feedback or express myself in my home. Think about everyone who's been mostly educated via Zoom these past two years. You go in a classroom, eye contact and body language is a totally different place it was three years ago, right? Students were able to have their camera off. Students weren't engaging in the same way, and yet we want them to bounce back into it. I'm saying the experiences and the settings I'm a part of, not yours. I'm not a part of your settings, but I've seen that huge loss of eye contact with students and students when they open up said, I didn't have to look at anyone via Zoom and I don't wanna look at anyone. And in me, instead of saying, oh, that's wrong, you know, do this, blah, blah, blah. It was being open. It was being patient. It was thanking and having gratitude of like, you know what, this helps me so much understand what I need to do better and be aware of. So if there's anything I can do, I'm gonna be right there for you. Maybe provide an example or two, right? Just of making the person feel like, okay, nothing's wrong with me. This is how I do things. I'm communicating that and this person's willing to work with me. So beautiful. Um, and then our last 30 minutes, we are gonna transition to historical trauma. There's a lot of definitions coming up because history, can be a huge influencing factor of our current day society. So let me know in the chat if there's more questions. I've been loving the questions I've been getting. I've been doing my best to answer them. And we have here Mandy, neural type. So neurodiversity, right? Can impact comfort level with eye contact as well. Absolutely. Um, there's always so much for us to learn. And I will say that doing trauma work you, you have to work in peers, you have to work in larger groups, you have to work with your supervisor of there's things I know, and there's things I don't know. And how are we, as a peer, educating one another, sharing our experiences, right, with confidentiality, because what you know, and how you do things, I can learn a lot from. I now know how to support that student, or you did something, and it went really great, or maybe you struggled with it, you should connect with your peer on that because you're doing similar work. That's a huge burden to carry by yourself. And we need to be collective within our work so that we can have the most impact, not only for the students, but impact of us not taking all those hits, right? Because we have some days at work where you just feel like, did today really happen? <laughs> you know, did I really have all of those losses in one day? So just, just want to have that. And, and thank you. We have here in the chat the affect, right? Emotional expression, emotional engagement seems to have flattened in many of the students, right? You get the, I don't know, or the shrug, or is this person really getting it? You know, are they expressing themselves? And it can be very confusing to you as a service provider. You are carrying any confusion. I deeply want to encourage you to work with that peer that supervisor, that team setting. Because as we learned about the body and stress, confusion is gonna run rampant within your body. It's gonna take space and memory within your body. And what's gonna happen when you're in a similar situation and that confusion is triggered, but now it's built up. Then you have some stress arousal. The students falling behind, not showing up. A lot of things might, might collapse or get further overwhelmed. And it's not that anything's wrong with you. It's a human need that we need some support. We need a debrief and we need a process together, right? And it's okay. It is totally okay. You're doing your best, but we got to do it together. So I really appreciate these comments coming in as we get ready to close up soon and just leaving you with some tips, information on more culture and trauma. So here is a definition of historical trauma, and this is a definition that is connected to all of us, right? We consider the United States, um, the Western Hemisphere, and the past 500 years, this is and will be Indigenous and Native land, right? And when we think about genocide, when we think about systems of enslavement, other forms of marginalization that has taken place of 500 years of colonization, not only in the Western hemisphere, but all over the world, 
you think about the emotional and psychological wounding that has taken place across lifespans, across generations, across groups. For many of us, not just in the Western hemisphere, but in the world, we weren't allowed to be with our families. We weren't allowed to celebrate our culture and our identity. We were criminalized in many extents for just being who we are, even though people have existed in their lineages, their communities, or cultures for tens of thousands of years before these past 500. And again, this is to respect and honor indigenous and native communities, not just in Western Hemisphere, but all over the world. And this photo is actually of a boarding school system that took place in the United States. It was a practice that separated all native children from their families until the age of 18. And essentially, there's this quote that was the slogan of how do you kill the Indian, but save the man? And this was a practice that barely ended. It was in the mid 60s, 70s. So we think about hundreds of years of wounding and not just for native and indigenous communities, right? When we think about how that trauma, that power, that oppression has impacted so many of us. And again, like Dr. Mate said, we're all wounded across the spectrum, all of us due to this history. So how does this impact you if you're like, Jocelyn, I need more than this historical perspective? There is a concept that all of us could be navigating of disenfranchised grief. So let me pause there. Disenfranchised grief really accompanies the trauma in itself. But before we go into that, when we think about our histories, especially if you are from a community that has experienced this generational and historical trauma, or you've witnessed it, or you're in this country, right? We have to also balance what is the intergenerational healing that we can give, that we can be a part of. You joining today's trauma topic can definitely be a part of that. You engaging in trauma conversations, you validating a cultural trauma that's not yours, and taking that extra pause, giving that grace, giving the opportunity for you to learn is an intergenerational support. So I just wanna throw that out there. Don't feel like you have to catch it. But when it comes to historical trauma, when it comes to everything that has taken place in the world, we have to think about how our life can be a message of healing, of support, of growth. Because think about this room today. We're of different races, ethnicities, backgrounds, socioeconomic, countries, backgrounds, you name it. And this country didn't have racial integration that long ago, yet we're all here and willing to learn from one another, do the same work, and serve communities across the board. That is extremely powerful and a result of those that have come before us and made the message happen. So there's probably other areas of your life other areas of your identity that someone started or carried the message of your belonging, your safety, your integrity. So this healing work, this intergenerational work, it's all out there, despite the amount of historical trauma that can make us feel like we're doomed. We have to work towards it, people, and we have to believe in ourselves and be that message that you already are. So just wanted to give you that before we transition back to more examples of historical trauma. Poverty is a set of circumstances, whether we think about events, experiences, or the effects. I'm sure you see this with students all the time, and maybe you've experienced this yourself. We have several poverty traps, one of them being if you are receiving social benefits, right? There's different names for it, and you start getting a job. You're barely sometimes making enough and then you lose those services and then you face a medical debt or you face another emergency or you face the food security lost. That's just one example. So I think as a team, poverty looks very different for all the students that you serve. Um, not a lot of students will be open about their financial or economic situation, but this is something that we need to spend some time on and think about it in our teams about the effects and those experiences. 
So now let's bring it back. We only have a few moments. We have some, we have minutes left. Don't get me wrong, but we're getting ready to transition out. And this is something that I want to validate you in. All of us have experienced a grief at some point. But we maybe also experience a grief and we're told it was ungrievable. You had to get over it. You isn't valid. Maybe it was suppressed. Maybe it was at one point in your life where you realized you couldn't go to your parents and you couldn't, you couldn't tell them or anyone, right? That is a form of un, it's like feeling ungrievable, disenfranchised, disempowered. This is something all of us have had. And you, you might see this with the students you interact with of they themselves have lost, have traumatic experiences, but are disenfranchised in that grief. So what are some examples so that I can be more specific with you, right? Because the more information that we have, the more that we know that we're not broken, there are societal, bodily, and historical things at play, you are validated in your potential and your experiences and that no one chooses trauma. So with that, this information is not to scare us, but when we're ready and when we feel like it's our time, we can tap in. And for everyone on this call, this is a lot of information. It's definitely overwhelming. It's okay if you close the door on some of these things. It's okay. You say, Jocelyn, I'm not ready for this. I'm not ready for that. This was great. But at least you know what's on the side of that door. And you are empowered to open it or get some friends or some other supports to open that door with you. So just want to encourage you. <laughs> You know, I know we're not in the same room together, but we got this, people. We got this. And we also can have those backs of others, like our students. So what are the ways that disenfranchised grief shows up? One, the relationship between the griever or the deceased. Um, it doesn't have to be someone passing away. It can be something gone, like a pet or a part of your life or an identity that you cherish and celebrate it and then something happened where you were attacked or harmed because of that identity. No one recognizes it. You're kind of lost within what actually took place and what happened, right? So gaslighting can be an experience that causes that being victim blame can cause you know similar reaction. We also want to look at when society or culturally, we see a loss, but we don't recognize it as significant, right? It's, it's not a big deal. And sometimes we hear these things in our own childhood, right? Like, and it's not, the, it's not to judge or, or attack those parents or you know, those adults, but we learn this message at a very early age of your behavior, your obedience, that's what we want here. You know, that's where you thrive. Like, that's what's great. It's like, well, I'm now suppressing my human needs to satisfy you because that's what, that's what makes you happy. And I want to make you happy or other examples, right? The there, It's called a trauma response when we please individuals in order to keep the peace, right? It's called fawning. Um, it's the fourth F and it's called fawning. It's so actually exa just an example, right? The last one is that there is stigma around the relationship and it does not align with social norms. So one example is um, being LGBT, and there was a point in time in this society where you could be excluded from being at the funeral. And this can still happen today, like it's not going away. You can be excluded from the funeral of your partner. You could be criminalized for the relationship or your sexual orientation, right? Um, you can be barred from visiting that loved one in the hospital and not being in those final moments, right? Just some examples, there's so much more. But this is something all of us have and can see in students. So this is a video that I'm not going to play because we're, we're, at, we're coming up time and it'll be sent afterwards. But it's really to look at how housing policy within the past, it was like 50, 60 years, has really impacted our landscape, not only geographically, but economically, socially and how we as a society have to take responsibility for the intergenerational disenfranchisement of communities. 
So we'll watch it. I'm sorry, y'all. I like definitely always pack a lot to these trainings, but you'll get all these follow-ups. Yeah, so so I'm going to skip that. I am going to show this little comic quickly as we get ready to transition that when we think about history, when we think about grief, when we think about everything that has taken place today, we're carrying a lot of people. And then you see this last part of the comic, right? And we are told or we tell ourselves that we're overreacting. And I, I'm sure if I ask people to raise their hands, people would say, yeah, I, I maybe experienced this. I went through this. This is something that actually happened to me this week, you know? Um, and I just want us to, to validate ourselves as individuals. But now let's take a step back. Let's think about students and all that they're carrying, not only for themselves, but maybe for their siblings, their own families, their own communities, their own friends, their own past selves, their own childhood traumas, you name it. So yeah, that's taking like a second zoom out, okay? Let's take another zoom out, like let's back it up even more and think about how we might talk and treat communities in this way of telling communities that we're not a part of that. I think you're overreacting. I don't think it's a big deal. Happens all the time across identities, communities, those subcultures we talked about. It happens in the media. It happens in real life. It happens in various settings. And we're all a part of it. We're all a part of it. So I need for us after today's training to validate yourself if you ever experience this comic, but also pause and think someone else going through this. Maybe you print it out and put it somewhere, you know, just as a reminder. And maybe some students check it out. I don't know. It can be another comic. So just some information for you. And as we get ready to close out in the last 10 minutes, drop questions. Sorry, like drop something. <laughs> as I said the word drop, that was very silly. I'm very sorry. Um, our role within cultural, historical, even bodily trauma is to not see ourselves as broken. That is something I would like climb a mountain for and scream as loud as I can. And it is not seeing yourself as an authority over this person's life, right? There is different models of coaching all of us have as a guide, right? So there's directive coaching and it's when someone's unfamiliar with a skill and it's brand new. It's like that intense learning curve, right? That we all feel in the beginning of the semester or quarter. And it is helping as that directive coach help people get unstuck while reducing frustration, right? You're not collapsing it. You're not minimizing it. You're not dismissing it. That's what it means to be a directive coach, okay? Maybe you're really good at asking question techniques, right? You know how to mix it up. Maybe you're very sensitive. Maybe you're sensitive. That's that's a skill. It's not a weakness, right? And you're the expert in providing non-judgmental feedback. There's also non-directive coaching. So you got to remember, you're a coach. You're on the sideline. You're not in the field. You're not kicking the ball. You're not my World Cup people. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> just throwing it out there if anyone's watching or keeping up with the World Cup. There's non-directive coaching where you're on the sideline and you recognize what you can and can't do for this individual. That's part of the limitation of your role and you don't have to shy away from that. It doesn't have to be the place of fear or insecurity that you're not doing enough. So some, what does it look like to be a non-directive coach? One is understanding your role is to help refine and strengthen the skills that this person already has by either helping them identify it, by being a sounding board. And sometimes it's paraphrasing back what this person shared with you. And bonus points, if you, from a genuine place, tell this person what you learned, what you took away, what amazed you, what you gained from these conversations, because one of our most basic human needs is to be heard and needed right? It sucks to show up somewhere and to feel like you're losing at life, you're deficient, everything's wrong. And that can definitely be how someone feels. But it's amazing, even when you're greeted, 
and there's that excitement, there's that attention, right? Just some examples of different coaching models. And our goal as this coach, you, is to really support the autonomy, right? By helping this student, this person self-analyze, self-monitor, self-evaluate. And you, right, you can play a powerful role in helping them explore their own thinking, being aware of information and how they're leading this process. But it takes some serious emotional uh, excitement. It takes, you know, some care, some energy that you have to give that to others. But it's just some examples of how you are all coaches. So how do we address impact and healing? We're getting ready to close out soon. Um, so I'm looking out to see if there's any questions. We've got six minutes left. Um, this is something I want you to continue after today. And like, fingers crossed, you at least consider it. And it is thinking about what are the individual impacts you've had, right? So take stock. It's the end of 2022. Take stock. How have you individually supported students or impact? What have you done? What have you changed? What have you picked up? I know you had to do things, especially returning to in-person programming. I see all your beautiful offices, right? Um, it's been a huge cultural shift being only online, hybrid to now in-person or a mix of all of it. Today's conversation has given you a lot of tools to honor what you've done, what you've given and what else you wanna explore. Don't be afraid to identify the barriers, the gaps, the challenges. We're always growing. The world is always evolving and none of us are perfect. But we can work in unity towards addressing these things. And if we can't address it or make it better, how do we add some speed bumps that I talked about to prepare people, to warn people, to practice with people what is some approaches or ways you want to engage if that comes up, along with the follow-ups, right, and how you respond when someone disclosed something? That is a powerful thing for us to think through before the crisis or the disclosure happens, and to not do this work by yourself. Community-level impact, I feel like this is across communities, but also what is your professional community and the impact that it's having? that you're able to tap into. If you're like, Jocelyn, professionally, I don't really got too many people. I don't got too many resources. You're here today. This, for, for me, as an outsider, this is definitely a community I'm walking into. But I also want to validate you. Community level impact can be, what are your support systems that you have within work and after work? So is there a hobby that you really want to check out? Is there something you can go to each week, each month, that makes you feel like you or like your best self. You can do this with a group, you can do this by yourself, but what is that commitment to your own community so that you can impact community itself as your truest self? I didn't say perfect, I didn't say fixed, I didn't say healed, I said your best, and we are all of our best people, even if you don't feel like it on this December 7th. I will see the best in you if you let me because it's already there. And then I gave you a lot of examples in the previous slide of directive. So what are things that you can do directly for someone? Think about what are non-direct things that you can do to allow that person to figure it out, right? To explore, to try, to, you know, piece some things together, whether it's connecting them with other resources, you name it. But you are not on the field, people. That student is, but you are that coach. So how do you support non-directive strategies, practices, resources? Let that person go out on the field and come back to you as a coach with not only those issues, but those successes you have brought out and have hopefully fostered. And collaborative coaching, everyone, is a beautiful model of we are all learning every time you interact with someone. It's a mutual process. So that is the training. I am so sad to let you go. 
It's been 90 minutes. I'm not sure how. And I'll leave you on this line before turning it to Amy that I want you to remember the intergenerational wisdom, resiliency, and resistance of those before you. All of us come from a lineage. All of us got great, great, great grandparents. And maybe it's that great aunt that's no longer in your life or that sibling or anyone. Remember that you are connected to them. We're connected to healing and we are connected to hopefully building a better world. So thank you for your time. I'm going to pass it to Amy and just again, appreciation to all of you. Thank you so much. I'd like to give Jocelyn a virtual round of applause or a real round of applause. That was fantastic. I felt myself nodding throughout the whole session. I did just dump in the chat there a um, link to the evaluation. So if you have a minute right now, go on and complete that evaluation. It, SurveyMonkey tells me it'll take you exactly three minutes to do so. Um, I do want to just thank Jocelyn so very much. It was a great conversation back and forth. Uh, we are back together next week again for vicarious trauma. And I do encourage you to everyone attend and also tell other people on campus. We have space. It's virtual. So we have all kinds of space for everyone. Um, so if you want to invite anybody to attend, please do so. And um, just a big party. Thank you. This was fantastic. And I'm realizing I have a little stress in my life, but um, that's, I think, also realizing that's pretty normal. So great. Um, Again, if all of you could take a minute to fill out the evaluation, because Jocelyn is going to take a look at those and see if there's things that we're missing, see if there's things that you need or things that we can do to improve this series for you. So thank you all so very much. And so Amy, um, really yeah. quick, sorry, we had a comment in there about certificates for PD hours. So yes. I'm putting in the chat the um, email address that you can send an email to because um, we will provide a certificate of um, attendance. And we have to kind of just check and make sure that you're on our Zoom list, um, but then we can get that sent your way. So two things with that. One, those will all go out Monday or Tuesday of next week. We just had a big week this week. I'm on another project. So the person who does that has been a little um, over busy. And um, the other thing is I want to make sure that everybody has your actual name, because if you are like Swagger 77, I'm not going to know who Swagger 77 is to verify that you were in attendance. So if you could make sure that in your renaming convention there, you can go on and make sure you have um, your name listed. And with that, yes, we will send you, um, send us an email and we will send you a certificate, but those will not be going out today. Those will go out Monday or Tuesday. Thank you so much, Amy. And I also saw another question about if videos would be shared. Yes, yep. um, there is a resource link, links, because we always, I always send links of um, the videos that were sent today, additional articles, um, I also like including supplement videos. So just to give you kind of more direction if you're interested in any areas. Um, and then we have a follow-up question of who are we sending email to? And I think it's the email that was dropped, correct? Um, yes, it's the email that was dropped in the chat or you can send it to me, but the email dropped in the chat will go to the individual who's producing those. And then again, um, that link is also in the chat. So I'll post it again. This is the professional development site um, for learning renewal. It will have the recording and then it'll also have whatever resources we share out in an email. And then Jocelyn will get us all the resources that are shared. She puts those together and then we will be sharing those out as well. And then Amy, if anybody gets out of here and doesn't have that information, feel free to email me. Mm -hmm. You all have received things from me because I sent you the invite. So you have my contact information as well. So don't hesitate to reach out to me and I'll make sure that I make those connections as well. And yes, last, I know we're at 1202, but just to clarify, you did not get a certificate yet for last week because the person who does those had a lot of other things that we needed to attend to. So you will get both certificates on Monday or Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, I believe, Amy, we have the vicarious, vicarious trauma. trauma. Yep. Yes. And I would say for that one, everyone, that's going to be very skill based. So I think we did impact of trauma. We did culture and trauma. That one's like, all right, help me, help me, mm -hmm. right? Give me the tools and tips. Um, and we'll be covering, we'll be covering a lot of action items. Um, so it's gonna, it's, it's gonna be good. It's gonna be definitely focused on healing. So I'm excited about that. So thank you again, Jocelyn. This has been fantastic. Thank you all for sticking with us and have a wonderful week and weekend. And we'll see you all next week on 
the 14th for vicarious trauma. Thank you. Everyone.